Welcome to Understanding Climate with Professor Monks. Today's topic, paleoclimate. We have a good set of direct measurements of climate going back to about 1880. But what about before that? Can we say anything about what was happening to the Earth's climate in earlier times? We can. Paleoclimate is the study of climate in the past. We can examine paleoclimate at a variety of scales. At different scales, we can use different sorts of information to learn about past climates. When we look at paleoclimate, we rely on what are called proxy data sets. In general terms, a proxy means a thing that stands in for another thing. In the climate context, a proxy data set is one that stands in for climate data like temperature and rainfall when we don't have direct measurements of them. One kind of proxy that we can use for the last couple thousand years is tree ring data. Trees grow for part of the year, then go dormant for the remainder of the year, producing a pattern of rings in their wood. Rings of different thicknesses indicate better or worse growing conditions. Because the sequence of thick and thin rings is distinctive, we can line up current trees' rings with rings from older trees, such as those found in archaeological sites, to reconstruct past climates. A variety of data sets like tree rings, as well as coral growth and other proxies, were used to create one of the most famous graphs in climate science, the so-called hockey stick graph. The hockey stick shows that over the past thousand years, temperature anomalies have been less than half a degree in either direction. But these changes were enough to have significant effects on human societies. For example, small positive anomalies around the year 1000 created what's known as the medieval warm period. During the medieval warm period, the Inuit were able to spread eastward through northern Canada and reach a land they called Kalachlit Nunat. Meanwhile, Norse sailors sailed west to the same place, calling it Greenland. But the medieval warm period was followed by some small negative anomalies known as the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age was cold enough to make the Norse pastures fail and their settlement collapse. The Inuit, on the other hand, were able to adapt and prosper in the new colder climate. The hockey stick graph gets its name because of the sudden upward bend over the last century, like the blade on a hockey stick. The current rise in temperatures is unprecedented over the last thousand years, and far more rapid than any other earlier temperature changes. Both the magnitude and the speed of current climate change give us reason to worry about the impacts on our world. Going back farther requires new proxy data. One important source of proxy data is ice cores. Just like trees have rings, the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland have built up in annual layers for hundreds of thousands of years. We can use a kind of drill to remove a cylinder of ice, called a core, that we can examine. Each ice layer contains tiny trapped bubbles of air, samples of our Earth's past atmosphere. This gives us a good record of things like greenhouse gas concentrations. We can also use the ice itself to determine past temperatures. Changes in the Earth's climate alter the balance between different isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen that evaporate and then follow snow and are incorporated into the ice. Based on these records, we can see that the Earth has gone through a series of cycles of warming and cooling, with a range of about 10 degrees between the lowest and highest temperature anomalies. The cool periods are known as glacials, when massive ice sheets covered large portions of the higher latitudes. The warm periods are known as interglacials. Our species, Homo sapiens, has been around for about 200,000 years. This means we have lived through two major glacial cycles. The most recent one reached its peak, called the last glacial maximum, about 18,000 years ago. The earliest agriculture in cities began in Southwest Asia around 10,000 years ago, at the start of the current interglacial period. Practically all of the history you know has occurred during this relatively stable climate period. So why do we have ice ages? The prevailing theory is that the glacial and interglacial cycles are triggered by slight changes in Earth's orbit and tilt, which change the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth, and how that radiation is distributed seasonally. The Earth's orbit swings back and forth between being closer to circular and more squashed or elliptical. The Earth's tilt wobbles. Sometimes we're more straight up and down, other times we lean over farther. And there's precession, which refers to changes in where the Earth's axis points to in the universe. When the Earth's orbit gets more circular, the Earth's axis gets less tilted, and the northern hemisphere is pointed toward the sun, that is, having its summer, at the point in the orbit furthest from the sun, then the northern hemisphere gets a little less solar energy during the summer. This small radiative forcing leads to cooler temperatures, which means snow that fell during the winter may not melt all the way. 
when snow builds up year after year, glaciers start to form. The northern hemisphere has a lot more land than the southern, so that's where glaciers mostly form during ice ages, and so changes to the northern hemisphere's radiative forcing cause global glacial and interglacial cycles. All of that water being added to the glaciers during glacial periods lowered sea levels by about 120 meters, creating land bridges between Siberia and Alaska, between Britain and continental Europe, between Australia and New Guinea, and elsewhere. Using those air bubbles in the ice, we can see an important feedback that enhances the effects of these changes in Earth's orbit and tilt. Changes in CO2 levels match very closely with changes in temperatures, though the temperature changes begin slightly ahead of the CO2 changes. This indicates that the initial forming comes from somewhere else, the changes in Earth's orbit and tilt that we just talked about. CO2 then acts as a feedback, enhancing the changes by altering the greenhouse effect. An important thing to remember for this feedback is that the ocean and atmosphere are constantly exchanging CO2. Changes in temperature change the size and even direction of the net flow when we add up the flows in both directions. Colder water can absorb more CO2, whereas warmer water absorbs less. At the start of a glacial cycle, we get a drop in solar radiation. This cools the Earth a bit. Under cooler conditions, the oceans absorb more CO2 from the atmosphere. The reduced atmospheric CO2 decreases the greenhouse effect, causing even more cooling. The overall result is a positive feedback loop, enhancing the cooling effect. In addition to the CO2 feedback, we also have the ice albedo feedback. Cooler temperatures mean more of the Earth, land and ocean, are covered in ice and snow. Ice and snow have very high albedos, so more of the sun's energy gets reflected back out into space. That leaves less energy to be absorbed by the Earth, further cooling temperatures. At the start of an interglacial cycle, the opposite happens. Increased solar radiation warms the Earth, which inhibits the uptake of CO2 by the ocean. That CO2 remains in the atmosphere, increasing the greenhouse effect, further warming the Earth. And the ice albedo feedback works in reverse as well. Warming means less ice and snow, which means lower albedo, which means more of the sun's energy is absorbed, which causes more warming. We've been in an interglacial period for the last 10,000 years, with the next glacial not due to start for another 50,000 years or so. But now anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have pushed our temperatures even higher. It took almost 10,000 years for the last glacial cycle to end, which involved about 4 degrees of warming. We've already caused about 1 degree of further warming over the last 100 years, a warming speed 20 times faster. In the next 100 years, we'd easily see another 2 or 3 degrees of warming, depending on which scenario proves to be correct. We're in the process of creating an inverse ice age, on an extremely compressed time scale. That's putting our Earth into territory that's unprecedented in the whole existence of our species.